Welcome back, everyone. Um, we were in James chapter 4, uh, and I see that uh, Sister Rupa, uh, you have raised your hand. Uh, Sister, you had uh, something to share? Ma'am, wrong touch, ma'am. Sorry. Oh, OK. No problem. No problem. That's all right. Uh, so yes, we were talking about submitting to God, then resisting the devil. And we also talked about the importance of uh, living our Christian life in such a way that we are aware of um, mistakes, errors, uh, things in our lives which are not aligned to God. And so James is calling us to repentance. And this is something that, uh, you know, that must be a part of our lives because it's it's like living your life in transparency with God. And uh, that's a powerful thing. So uh, he invites us. He says, OK, walk in this way. Walk in humility. Humble yourselves in the sight of God. And God is faithful. He will lift you up. Now, moving on to the next section here, let's read uh, verse 11 and 12 of uh, chapter 4. Any volunteers? Can I read? OK, I let both of you decide, Asha and Avni. Go, go on, Asha. Asha, you read. Asha, you read. <laughs> OK, we haven't reached the decision. OK, fine. Thank you. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evils of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge other? Another, sorry. Yes, thank you, Asha. Uh, as uh, it's quite self-explanatory, he is um, telling the believers not to speak evil of one another. Uh, remember the power of the tongue that he talked of earlier. So now he's saying, don't speak evil. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. So does this mean that we can't have a judgment or let's say we can't determine uh, whether something is right or wrong in what a christian brother is doing uh, that's not the point that's not what he's saying of course we we will be able to assess and understand whether somebody is right or wrong uh, and you know there are certain settings in which one has to make decisions isn't it? And that setting would be uh, the work situation where, um, let's say, believers are working together, and uh, one is one is uh, a boss, and others are employees. Now, in those circumstances, it is, you know, it it is really key that. Uh, situations are assessed, situations are analyzed, conclusions are drawn. And if there is a requirement, even correction must be administered. So in those settings, to bring up this scripture and say that, oh, the Bible says, don't judge your brother. Don't judge your brother. No, it won't be applicable because the context is different. Uh, so yes, we can have an opinion about uh, whether something is right or wrong. And in settings where uh, Christians are working under uh, each other, it is important to have an honest opinion and also bring correction when required. So we are not being uh, prevented from judging matters with honesty. Okay, That's not the point. But this is something like you know us uh, judging a, a, a brother when we don't have the authority to do that, or when we are being too quick to judge somebody. Uh, so in, in those situations is, is what uh, James is actually you know um, uh, stating this. And he's saying, but if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. So when 
there is no uh, authority to to judge and instruct one a person and then we are doing it uh, that's when you know james is saying look it's not appropriate uh, and he says that ultimately you know the judge is god uh, and so we must uh, fear him and he is the one who is able to save and to destroy so he is the ultimate judge so who are we to pass judgments on our brothers and sisters now the other flip side of this is flattery right like where we don't ever evaluate situations honestly we let things go uh, because we want to be in the good books of everyone now that is an other extreme error that one can get into so both of these quick judging and um, flattering people we must avoid these uh, and uh, uh, rather than that you know when we are in that position of authority honest assessment honest evaluation and honest constructive criticism is a, a good thing to actually do and james is not preventing us from doing that now coming to the next section here verses 13 to 17 uh, could somebody please go ahead and read this maybe avni since uh, the last time there was okay thank you yeah. yes yes avni 13 to 17 Come now, you who say, "Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit," whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, "If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that." but now you boast in your arrogance all such boasting is evil therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him it is sin amen amen thank you avni so this section uh, the essence of this section is depend on god don't run ahead of god that's the point so when people make plans without knowing the purpose of god the um, mind of god the intentions of god right what happens is like what james said earlier we ask amiss we ask for our own pleasures and those prayers don't get answered similarly when we plan we say today tomorrow we will go here we will go there um, uh, we we will do these things we will do business we will make a profit now if it is coming from a place of depending on ourselves and not on god then such plans uh, uh you know he he saying don't don't make such plans because he's talking about the uncertainty of life he's saying see we don't even know what will happen tomorrow and he uses this analogy which is used uh, in in the old testament quite a bit in the psalms where our life is a vapor that it is um, it is temporal it's here and then it's gone in no time so when life is uncertain when life is short uh, you know well, depending on ourselves we are making all these grand plans uh, for our future without depending on god and uh, that is not a uh, 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 you know christian thing to do that's not a biblical thing to do but instead he points them to depending on god so uh, we can make plans but as long as it's coming from the right place of depending on god so in verse 15 he teaches them he tells them look instead you ought to say if the lord wills we shall live and do this or that so the context is depend on god and make plans don't make your own plans okay now using this passage to say that oh planning is co not correct uh, one shouldn't plan because the bible says that life is so uncertain so that again is um, erroneous simply because planning is scriptural now in the book of uh, proverbs we we read that uh, one needs to ponder uh, the path of their feet okay in proverbs 6 verses 6 through 8 so god is saying 
think about the future plan for the future it's not unbiblical similarly there are passages that say that one needs to have foresight look way ahead into the future and uh, um, see you know whether you need a plan b plan c so having foresight is encouraged in scripture proverbs 22 verse 3 so this passage is not asking us to you know live life by the moment that's definitely not what this passage is telling us to do we have to look at uh, what the rest of scripture says planning is a good thing but here planning uh, with self-dependence that is the issue that james is pointing to and he says no depend on god if it is god's will you will be able to do it then you make your grand plans go ahead and do those things so depend on god mainly that's the point now verse 16 and 17 he says uh, but now you boast in your arrogance all such boasting is evil therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him it is sin um, he's simply again pointing us to depending on god and by the grace of god uh, step up uh, if there are opportunities and do what god is pointing to uh, and even if we don't do that he's telling us look it would be sin if you're able to do something and you're not doing it that's also sin so uh, with that we come to the end of chapter four here uh, if there is anything that you want to discuss we could do that right now we will soon move ahead with chapter five yes Okay, uh, seem like someone, yes, Asha. I is that a question you have? Yes, Pastor. Um, about James 4, verse 6 to 10, we talked about the first invitation was the um, first point, and the second one, what is the second point? I'm sorry, I don't think I lost track. Yes. So uh, James 4, 6 to 10, no? Yes, Pastor. Yes. So one is about uh, the importance of humility and how when we have humility, we will be uh, further empowered by God. That's the first point. Second is uh, spiritual warfare, where um, the best position for us to overcome the devil is, one is be submitted to God and also... Uh, resist him or go against him so spiritual warfare the second one third one is intimacy we're drawn near to god he will draw near to you and the fourth is to have a uh, to be to have a heart which is repentant so the, that's the fourth fourth point at least four key points over there thank you pastor yep no problem Okay, let's move on then. Let's uh, move to James chapter 5. Uh, could somebody please read from verse 1 to verse 6? James chapter 5, verse 1 to 3. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. A corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Uh, Christopher, could you go on till verse six, please? Oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, no worries. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself, yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. 
Yes, thank you, Christopher. So uh, James is addressing the rich. Uh, remember, even earlier, he talked about um, treating everyone equal in the church. And he gave that example, if a rich man comes with many rings, uh, then you know how are you going to treat him? And a poor man comes. So you should treat everyone equal. The reason why he is talking about this is the church had all kinds of people. There were rich people. There were also poor people. Now, he uh, states over here that the rich, right? And from what he is saying, it seems like they have exploited the poor. So who is he addressing? Is he addressing uh, anyone who is rich in general? No. He is addressing the exploitative rich. So that we have to understand. Why are we saying that? Because uh, to have wealth, to be rich, even in, in the world, it's not an ungodly thing. Because we know from scripture that God is the one. He blessed uh, Abraham and, you know, he made him very wealthy, uh, right? And you have many other uh, people that we can talk about. And uh, like even David, that he was truly blessed. So you find that uh, wealth and riches are a blessing from the Lord. So James is not contradicting that. He's, he's not saying that in order for us to walk with the Lord, we have to be uh, economically poor and only then, you know, God will be pleased with us. That's If we understand it that way, then we are taking these scriptures out of context. So what is the context from verse 1 to 6 when we read in continuation? It's very clear that he's talking to the exploitative rich. They have become rich by exploiting others. So what are some points uh, that he's making here from verses 1 to 3? He is helping us know that riches um, are temporal, right? So he says, your riches are corrupted. Uh, corrupted is also that they were not gained in the right way and so that's why the term corrupted there they're not blessed riches uh he is saying that garments are moth eaten uh which refers to the again what they have gained is not blessed so when something is not blessed it's not going to stay forever okay so that's the point he's making it's temporal it's come and it will go away and he's saying your gold and silver are corroded. Earlier he said corrupted. Now he's saying corroded. Um, and this corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. So the riches which were gained exploit through exploitation, he's helping us know that they are not going to last forever. Okay. Now, when riches are gained, through righteous means, we know the Bible says that they are a blessing, right? That those things will stay on with us. It even says about a righteous man that he will leave behind an inheritance for his children's children. So blessings will last. They will endure when you get it the righteous way. But when it is ill-gotten gain, there are terms like corrupted, corroded, but God is saying, it's not going to last. And there's a warning in there for uh, those who exploit. From verse 4 onwards, he says, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. So when there is injustice, okay, something beautiful for us to notice here is, the prayers of the exploited reach God. Okay. That's, that's what this verse is saying. Do we remember when the Israelites were in Egypt and they were ill-treated by the Egyptians? The cries of the people reached the ears of the Lord. So when there is injustice, we may ask the, the question, Where is God? 
does god see does god notice here our passage is telling us that god is not um you know it's it's not like he doesn't understand what's going on he hears the cries of the exploited those who are experiencing injustice it say it says that there are people who have not received their wages uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know uh, things have been kept back from them by fraud their cries are reaching the ears of and it introduces god here as the lord of sabbath so we must be um, uh, you know we, we have to understand here it doesn't say the lord of the sabbath because there is a reference to the lord of the sabbath in the new testament but it's not saying the lord of the sabbath it says the lord of sabbath so the lord of sabbath in the hebrew is the lord of hosts or the lord of the armies which armies are we uh, talking about the angels you know the heavenly uh, armies and so what james is saying is it's a warning the cries about injustice directly reach god and this god is a god of vengeance he will um he he will you know um work on behalf of those who uh, are being exploited so he's warning the exploitative rich that don't think god is not taking notice and he's also the god of the armies he knows what to do there is vengeance he will uh, take vengeance against injustice so verse 5 you have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury you have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter you have condemned you have murdered the just he does not resist you okay so these things are going on and uh, maybe the exploitative rich thought that ah it's fine we can just enjoy our lives things are going to go on the same way uh, and uh, you know we we will have a beautiful life but he is warning them and he's saying look uh, just because you are in your pleasure right now doesn't mean that uh, god is going to keep quiet about these matters okay now let's move ahead let's go to the next section here yes yes please Yes, 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 Pastor Nasi. Um, I, I would like to ask a question. Um, yes, I, I'm one who who hates injustice, but at the same time, where do we strike a balance in in the sense whereby you know we see injustice in the world, and then um, we want to fight for the rights of the people. how do we balance not going overboard but still maintaining our our stands because there is a possibility for we as christians just to be quiet when we see injustice in the land and feel that it doesn't have anything to do with us and i think to a great extent sometimes the church is always laid back when there are times of opportunities we could have capitalized on to establish the stance of god the gospel in the eyes of many things that happen in our society but i think my main question is how do we ensure that you know in terms of fighting injustice and fighting for those who are are weak in society we do not lose our um we don't lose our identity in the midst of all this we don't end up being caught up with the social injust- injustice but rather um fighting the cause in truth and you know in light of our christian our christ uh, our our call to being christians yes uh, say it's a uh... you know it's a very important question that we need to ask ourselves as christians um so as you have pointed out there is a there is a a wise way of addressing matters of injustice um uh, so i would say that when we notice injustice begin with prayer uh, and as we 
cry out to the Lord and as we ask him for wisdom, the wisdom that James is talking about over here, right? The kind of, the God kind of wisdom, which is pure, peaceable, gentle, um, right? So that wisdom will help us uh, take the necessary steps is what I would say. So we need to ask God for that kind of wisdom to be able to do something about the injustice because there is a right timing there is a right manner there are um, you know the right people in the, the positions of influence uh, that we we must work through them sometimes and that would be the best way uh, to address these matters so really wisdom is the key so pray for wisdom and uh, with wisdom step out uh, at at the right time and one challenge which uh, you also pointed out is uh, that you know sometimes what happens to the church or the body of believers is uh, we yes we have to you know injustice affects us uh, and and uh, we want to do something about it but in doing that we may lose our primary cause and that is the spiritual uh, you know cause that we have as the body of Christ where uh, uh, we we are here uh, to be strong in the word to be strong in the work of the spirit uh, but what has happened is believers have gone uh, you know with with missions against injustice and it's become a social movement it's become a social movement and it, it, it no longer is what the church should be right so the the work of the church has gotten uh, if i may use the word you know uh, um, diluted when when i say diluted i i simply mean forgetting the main cause of the church uh, preaching the word and all that and then just becoming just a you know like a social justice movement uh, and and losing our main purpose that has also happened and that's a danger um, and so wisely i'm sure there'll be people in the church whom god will raise up uh, who whom we can empower encourage and lead uh, in 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 these acts of justice but as a church body, uh, we should not lose our focus. Does does that help? Say, does it make sense? It, it does. It does well. Thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, even as we trace back to some of uh, the great uh, justice movements in the world, uh, we would we would see that prayer and uh, believing people driving it uh, was the cause for those movements to be successful right uh, so anyway i will just leave it at that for now now moving ahead we are at the next section verses 7 through 12 of chapter 5 can uh, somebody please read it Be patient, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Yes, thank you, Christopher. Uh, so what we see in this portion is he's speaking to the oppressed. He spoke to the oppressors and uh, again, you know, it's very interesting that the oppressed and the oppressor are part of the same 
uh, family of believers. Now he's speaking to the oppressed and he's saying, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. So he is encouraging those who uh, are waiting for God's justice or waiting for the fulfillment of God's promises. And he says that we must endure. We need patience. Okay? And uh, gives us this analogy of a farmer who is waiting. He sows, but he waits for a season for the crop to um, grow and then you know the fruit uh, to fruit or whatever, the grain to actually emerge uh, and there is a timeline isn't it it doesn't happen overnight it doesn't happen tomorrow and that is the same uh, concept that he's helping us uh, learn here and he says it's going to take some time and therefore we must be patient for God to move on our behalf and he says, uh, also be patient establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand so it's like a reminder uh, that Ultimately, you know, our savior will come, uh, our deliverer will come, uh, our king will come. Uh, just be patient. Just be patient. Trust him, right? Have your hearts stabilized. Don't be anxious. Oh, what's happening? Uh, I don't have anyone. Where is the justice? Don't get anxious. We have a deliverer. We have a God. We have uh, a king who is, is for us. Uh, and then he also tells those who are going through oppression or difficulties. Uh, he tells them to have a good attitude in the midst of challenges. Because what happens when we go through challenges, uh, the automatic thing is to get uh, you know, very cynical, to, to uh, lose faith, to uh, speak our doubts. So we lose our stability as believers when we are going through tough times. But instead of that, he shows us the right way of enduring uh, any form of challenge and in this case, oppression. So what does he tell them? He tells them, uh, do not, first of all, be patient. Then the next thing he says is, do not murmur. OK, do not murmur. So that is to say that, OK, yeah, don't grumble what is this but god you said but these things are happening we we have the tendency to grumble or murmur uh, and and so he says please don't do that and persevere till the end trusting god and he brings to us the example of this man called job uh, who was greatly afflicted afflicted from every side but we know that his testimony uh, is such that he never let God down. No matter what happened to him, he did not let God down, right, with his words um, uh, or, or his faith. And so he tells the people, look at Job. He went through so much, but he was able to hold on to his faith. Now, why can't we be like Job? Why can't we be such people? Because ultimately, we know our God, isn't it? Everything boils down to uh, our relationship with God and our knowledge of God. And we already know that our God is very compassionate. He's very merciful. Uh, and, and he's faithful. Things will turn out uh, for the better. And so hold on. Trust in the Lord. Maintain a good attitude. Uh, and finally, you know, over there in verse 12, he, he states, uh, he says, do not swear okay, by heaven or by earth. So is he saying that one must not make an oath? Is that his point? Uh, not really. Uh, because we know that even, uh, you know, uh, in Hebrews, we, we read that uh, uh, God made an oath. <laughs> so making an oath, determining to do something for the Lord, there's nothing wrong with that. But if we look at the context of uh, James's times, uh, it is said that religious people uh, made compromising oaths. Uh, you know, they, they would have their own clauses. Uh, they would lie uh, for their own benefit. So there was that whole, whole uh, way of making an oath, which he's addressing in this 
in this particular verse. So he's not saying don't make an oath, but he's saying when you make an oath, let, be true to it. Uh, let your heart be true to the oath that you make. And that's why he's saying, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Because they would say one thing and, you know, uh, deceivingly or in hip, uh, hypocrisy, do something else. And they would have explanations for that. Uh, and, and that is the matter that he's actually talking about over here. All right. So if we are fine, if we are good with that, then we can proceed to the uh, last section here. Uh, any anything to, to talk about in the earlier section or okay let's uh, go to verse 13 to to 18 verse 13 to 18 is anyone among you suffering let him pray is anyone cheerful let him sing psalms is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Amen. Thank you, Say. So over here, there are instructions for people who are going through different things, uh, different seasons in their uh, journey with the Lord. He's saying, uh, if somebody is suffering, right, uh, what should that person do? Pray, seek the Lord, uh, ask for God's intervention. He says, if there is somebody who's cheerful, it happens, right? The same church, uh, same time, but one is uh, doing so uh, great, another is going through a, a, a difficult phase in their lives. So he's giving an instruction to each one. And uh, so if one is cheerful, he says, let him sing psalms. Uh, if there's anyone sick, what should that person do? Call for the elders of the church and have them pray over him, um, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, yes. So he is asking anyone who is sick to ask for prayer. Okay. So uh, here coming to the part where he says, mm, if there's anyone sick, let them ask for the elders of the church. Why is he asking for the elders of the church? When we look at verse 15, it says, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So the reason why the elders of the church uh, are here in the picture is because they can pray a prayer of faith. That is important. Now, what if... Uh, you know, in our context, we are not able to call an elder of the church to come home. See, as long as somebody is praying the prayer of faith, that prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. So the important thing is the prayer of faith. And hopefully the elders of the church will pray the prayer of faith. One more uh, key thing that we see here is they are being asked to anoint with oil. Why oil? Simple. When when we pray with oil or any um, uh, you know substance, we know uh, that the power and the presence of the Lord, right, is released through this act. That's the only simple reason why this is done. It's not that oil has magical powers or you know, any other substance has magical powers. No, that there, there, 
we can relate to this because of you know things that have happened in the in the book of acts that substances were used to release the power and the presence of god so oil here is just a substance which is used to release the power and the presence of god upon the sick person and also take authority pray with oil anoint with oil in the name of the lord so in the name of the lord is what authority we are praying a prayer of faith we are releasing the power and the presence of god we are speaking by authority then we can expect god to heal that person okay so that's what he's saying now coming to the next section here he says confess your trespasses one to another again in relating uh, to uh, you know brethren or believers and we could even say in the context of sickness sometimes there are open doors uh, because you know we haven't dealt with matters we haven't asked the lord for forgiveness so even in that situation uh, he's saying yes it's possible to confess trespasses one to another and that also will uh, accelerate god's healing now because of this particular scripture you know confessing of sins uh, people put a lot of emphasis on that so how should sin be confessed we know that now that there is only one mediator between god and man the lord jesus christ we don't need any other mediators to whom we must confess our sins any human beings or any saints it's not required in fact here it says confess to one another so being a believer you're confessing to another believer which is okay which is fine you don't really need somebody at another level to share your uh, sins you know as a confession so this is a uh, not what it has been made out in the christian circle sometimes uh, it's a very simple admitting one's one's uh, uh, sin that uh, james is talking about and when we do that in a wise way healing comes healing comes right even in relationships healing comes okay uh, yes say so 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 pastor uh, correct me if i'm wrong what james is referring to mainly there is faults not necessarily um confessing all your past sins to people in the church it more or less basically like if you fault one another and then you just is that the context james is coming from because like you said this has been permit me to use the word bastardized in the sense that people feel that starting again from the catholic church where they feel you must go and confess to a father and then some people feel that you must tell somebody about what you have done before you are free so i, I don't know could is this a context of you faulted somebody and then you just go back to the person to you know um kind of reconcile in that sense i don't know if you can correct me my from wrong no, uh yes say so to to come to a conclusion on confession we look at all of scripture jesus is the mediator okay and we pray to the lord jesus so automatically confession is happening as we pray as we keep short accounts with the lord and if you look at what apostle john wrote uh, 1 john chapter 1 verses 7 through 9 there also he says confess your sins we confess our sins the lord is faithful to forgive us so confession primarily is to the lord which is understood now if required only if required confess your sins one to another now it's not a must it's not a you know should and must you have to tell if you made a mistake you have to tell a believer that's not uh, that's not correct because primarily we are called to pray and we're already doing it we are confessing our sins to the lord so uh, it's it's settled in that manner but there could be times like in this special context when he's talking about you know sickness or uh, not always not always we know that there are many factors for someone being sick but in the event of there being an unconfessed sin he's saying you please confess because it will bring your healing Uh, speedily uh, so i would say if required confess to one another we should not impose it on all believers all the time and say 
you have to talk about your sins to other believers you know what sometimes that creates more trouble because the other person that you're sharing your problems with may not have the wisdom uh to keep it to themselves or give you the right advice so what just happened we made a mess of everything by telling anyone about what we have done okay uh, so do, does that help uh, say perfect answer thank you pastor thank you yeah thank you thank you so much so that's about confession uh five more minutes to go and then just trying to finish chapter five here uh so yeah confession he dealt with that now prayer he's talking about prayer also in prayer he says effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much now we are the righteousness of god in christ jesus so every believer can can use these scriptures okay when we are walking right with the lord then what happens he says effective fervent prayer what is effective fervent prayer um effective prayer uh, comes from the greek word energio it means active okay it it means um to be mighty in or you're going after something you're not letting go of it so that is effective right effective then earnest prayer earnest we know when we are um sort of persevering in prayer right uh when we are persevering in prayer so we are going with energy and we are persevering we are persistent in prayer when we pray in this way he says there's going to be a result to the prayer avails much and then he talks about the prayer of elijah he tells us look elijah was not special he was also a human being but what did he do he prayed earnestly that was what made uh, things work and he gives that uh, uh, example there about how when he prayed it did not rain and then he prayed it uh, rained but also when elijah prayed uh, if you remember uh, he had a promise of god but he prayed seven times so there is that earnestness that perseverance in elijah's prayer when he did it the right way with energy and with perseverance things happened so he's telling us the same thing come on now why is he talking about this in the context S somewhere when uh, healing is being spoken of he's talking about eff effective and uh, earnest prayer because you see manifestation of healing also uh, sometimes it's quick sometimes it's it takes a while but he's encouraging the believers and he's saying don't give up the prayer of faith will heal the sick but the effective earnest prayer of the righteous man avails much meaning keep praying don't stop praying elijah prayed elijah prayed persistently and it happened so when you don't give up you can also see the outcome of prayer uh and then you know finally the last section here i'll just go to that verses 19 and 20 um he says brethren if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins so you know when he's talking about persistent prayer two things are somewhere connected one is healing one is praying for somebody who has wandered away you now both these prayers sometimes take a while and uh, if we are not careful uh, we can entertain discouragement and he doesn't want the believers to be discouraged he says look when you're praying for healing when you're praying for somebody who has gone far away from god don't stop don't stop we will see um, the outcome we will see the intervention of god so be like elijah continually pray with energy pray with persistence and uh, god will do the work in their lives okay so with that i stop we are done with uh, james we'll pick up uh, first peter 1 in the next class which is next tuesday okay next tuesday same time uh, so could somebody please pray as we wrap up today's sessions Shall I pray, ma'am? Yes, yes, Abhi. Father God, we are so thankful to you for your words of truth that lead us, sanctify us, Father, and strengthen us, Father. 
Lord, help us. Help us whatever we have learned that we may apply it in our lives, be blessed in it, be strengthened in it. Father, walk by it and see your mighty hand moving in every situation, Father. For we know that you have given us these words and these words are spirit and these words are life. We thank you for this time when we have learned, Father, and we bless each one who is going to hear this and be blessed in it. Bless the pastor. And we bless you for all the good things you're doing in our lives and through our lives. We give you glory. We give you honor and praise for who you are and how you lead us. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Avni. And thank you, everyone. Really grateful that uh, you made it up and we could have this class today. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Asha. God bless. Bye. Bye, everybody.